Ladies and gentlemen, John Lithgow. By chance, the first person I will introduce tonight is himself, a former host of this event, with far more impressive authorial credits than mine. He is the author of some 36 critically acclaimed books, including the best-selling mystery series featuring Easy Rollins. His work has been translated into 23 languages and includes literary fiction, science fiction, political monographs, and even a young adult novel. He is the winner of numerous awards, including the O. Henry, a Grammy, and Penn America's Lifetime Achievement Award to present the Literarian Award for Outstanding Service to the American Literary Community. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome Walter Mosley. You know, the, the, the major job of introducing anyone is to um, be really short and also to talk about them. I was remembering earlier today, somebody introduced me once, and they, the, the first thing they said is, I was born in East St. Louis. They, they were born in East St. Louis. And they talked about that for 10 minutes. And they said, Walter Mosley was born in Los Angeles. I'm sure he had the same experience as I did, and then asked me up. I won't do that to Mitchell Kaplan. Mitchell Kaplan is handsome, hale, and hairy. <laughs> He's shown a rare business savvy in a very difficult enterprise at a disastrous moment in our economic history. He is socially conscious in a way that allows for a sense of complete equality while fostering great writing and a high literary standard. Mitch is the heart and soul of the Miami Book Fair which opens all of its doors and windows to a collection of words and writers that are not always honored, but are, still in all, deeply important to the meanings of our lives. Handsome, hale, hairy. <laughs> the truth is, we in the cultural world do not often award handsome business cunning. We do not honor wealth without a donation or health for any reason whatsoever. Mitch's distinction, more than anything else, is his hirsute mammalian quality. <laughs> he, like our tiny furry ancestors, came out from a hole in the earth when the great dinosaurs were reaching the limit of their evolutionary journey. He, Mitchell, is our hero, not because he is a success, but because he has survived and brought with him hope and a blueprint. When we representatives of all the various strata of the book business and the book world look at Mitch, we see promise. We see that what we love and what we live by and live for has the potential and the ability to survive and thrive. That is Mitchell Kaplan's beauty and the reason we honor him with the Literarian Award for Outstanding Contribution to the American Literary Community. Mitchell Kaplan. I just have to say that um, it's a really good thing I didn't shave my beard this morning the way I thought I was going to. But thanks, Walter. You know, when I, when I heard uh, that you were the one who was going to be presenting this award to me, I was really, really pleased. I was pleased that I would have the opportunity and the chance to tell you in person and publicly how much I admire what you do and how you do it. I've seen for years how you mentor young writers and what that means to them. I've seen you literally go into the belly of the beast and ask for responsible political discourse. 
people don't always listen, but you always ask, and your unwavering support for what we all do, booksellers and publishers alike, is really remarkable. And that work of yours, uh, that piece that I read by you just a few weeks ago in the New York Times, and I'm sure many of you read it as well, was really breathtaking. So thanks, Walter. I'm really honored to have been presented by you this evening. And, I, and thank you as well to all the other board of directors of the National Book Foundation and its executive director, Harold Augenbrum, for this recognition. I'm really humbled to be mentioned in the very same breath as uh, Ferlin Getty, Robert Silvers, and Barbara Epstein, Terry Gross, Barney Rossett, Dave Eggers, and Joan Gantz Cooney. And to have actually been included in the same press release as the great John Ashbery just seems really wrong. <laughs> I congratulate him and all of the authors nominated tonight. I also stand here and accept this recognition alongside many, many others who have made it possible for me to have this life, this marvelous life, as a bookseller, and who are here with me, many of them tonight, sitting at my table. My partners and investors, Marvin and Issa Leibowitz, David Lewant, Susan and David Friedson, my sister and brother-in-law, and Paula Mazur, and of course, my parents, Joseph and Helen Kaplan, who are there with me tonight, who very early on taught me the... Yes, they deserve a big round of applause. You know, they taught me very, very early on the value of a good book, and they also showed me that, you know, you could follow one's passion in life, even if it won't make you a whole lot of money. To Jonah, Daniel, and Anya, my three wonderful kids, and to my wife, Rochelle, you're my inspirations and why I do what I do. And to the youngest member of our table, my niece, Maya, you, with your incredible passion for books, is why we're all really here, to ensure that you'll always have something to read far, far into the future. I'm also fortunate to work with a remarkable group of booksellers and affiliate partners all the way from the Cayman Islands to West Hampton Beach. So to, so to the entire Books and Books family, thanks for making me look so good. I also stand shoulder to shoulder with booksellers everywhere who are doing the same kind of work I am in their own communities across this country, and with those booksellers who are no longer with us, but who were my role models and my mentors. You know, it's really a, a bit strange standing here in front of all of you, so many of you friends, so many of you mentors, so many of you giving me encouragement at the very beginning, almost 30 years ago, when I opened a very small one-room Books and Books in Miami. 30 years. It's been just a blink. Miami wasn't a very happy place back then. The Mario boat lift had just happened two years before. Race riots revealed deep, deep divisions. And with war breaking out across Latin America and despots ruling in the Caribbean, refugees from across the region were washing up on our shores. There was also kind of an infamous Time Magazine cover story at the time that all of us in Miami keep repeating. Uh, this came out in about 1983, and it said, Miami, paradise lost. I was a 25-year-old recovering law school student with a keen sense that I wanted to do something with purpose. And when I took stock of those things that meant the most to me, it all came down to the power of the word, to books, to being a part of literary culture. And since, at the time, I spent more time in Kramer Books, the Savile Bookshop, and the original Olsons in Georgetown than I did at the law library of the school I went to, I became determined to return to Miami and open a bookshop, which I did in 1982. At that time, it was a golden age of book selling. English majors and law school dropouts like me all over the country were opening stores in cities and towns everywhere augmenting the wonderful shops that had been operating for decades. Over 50% of all books sold were sold in stores like mine then, and there were close to 6,000 members of the American Booksellers Association. These became the great good places of their communities, 
places for readers to gather, writers to be launched, and where the links to the next generation of book lovers would be forever forged. The power of the word, the power of books, the creation of a community of readers, which would propel our literary culture for the next few decades, were what drove these booksellers and these bookstores. A small, dinky store like mine could have an impact, and we were welcomed into the literary tribe with open arms. I'll never forget the thrill when on a slow afternoon at the bookshop, about a year after we opened, I looked up from the counter to see Roger and Dorothea Strauss browsing our fiction section. I tried to act really cool, letting them browse uninterrupted. But I could hear their conversation without having to strain too much. They were marveling at the notion that we were carrying the new North Point Press version of Hermann Brock's Death of Virgil the one with the French flaps, picking it up and turning it around as if it were a fragile gem. I knew I had chosen wisely. No wills and trusts for me. Selling books is what I would be doing, but little did I know that I would also be helping soon Miami redefine itself. As I said, Miami was not a very happy place in 1982, but just two years after we opened, it began to develop a bit of a smile. At the behest of a visionary campus president at our local community college, a group of us were called upon to start the Miami Book Fair International. And we were charged with nothing less than helping to transform the entire downtown Miami area into something much more vibrant than it was then. Dr. Eduardo Padron, a mentor to so many of us in South Florida, understood the power of the word understood that books and writers could go a long way to healing a community. He threw the weight of the college behind the fair, and in that very first year, thousands and thousands of Miamians came to hear authors and browse book booths. Whole families came, black, white, brown, from every nook and cranny of Miami's diverse landscape. Programs featuring James Baldwin, Amiri Baraka, Allen Ginsberg, Mario Vargas Llosa, Joseph Heller, were filled to the brim. Newer writers like Dave Barry, Carl Hyacin, Les Standiford, and James W. Hall were finding their voices and their audiences. We had programs in Spanish and Creole and writers from the Caribbean. Miamians came to linger under that big tent that was the Miami Book Fair that first glorious year. But it wasn't really as easy as it might seem. Back then, nobody thought much serious stuff or reading went on down in Miami. I remember the time that I asked a pretty prominent publisher if he'd send a pretty prominent author to us. And his response was something like, uh, no, you know, not her, but, but we have this author of a new non-prescription drug book who would be perfect. <laughs> Old people, beach readers, that's the way Miami was looked at. Now, as we move into our 28th book fair, it's actually taking place right now. If you're quiet, <laughs> If you're quiet, you might be able to hear John Sayles reading tonight, right now, down in Miami. Um, and if you're going to be there on Sunday, you might be able to catch Michael Moore as well, who'll be with us. Um, but you can always see it on C-SPAN. They come down, they cover it live. So please watch it there. Um, but now, 20, 29 years later, uh, Eduardo Padron is the president of the entire Miami-Dade College system with 180,000 students, which is the largest in the nation. The center at Miami-Dade College has been established for year-round literary programming. Parents are bringing their children to the very same fair that introduced them to the joys of reading years before. And now, so many years later, although, although there are many things that can be said about Miami, no one can say that it's not a vibrant, diverse, and interesting place to be, and that it doesn't have a distinct and full literary community. The power of the word, the power of the book. And although the roots of Books and Books and the roots of the Miami Book Fair were laid in that golden age, I firmly believe that even with all the upheaval we find in our industry today, there's room for plenty of optimism. Writers are writing marvelous and important books. Publishers are publishing them. And as every bookseller knows, readers want to know about them and they want to buy them. 
Our challenge today is to figure out and solve the complex distribution issues that have developed because of the changing world we now operate in. We need to reassert the role of the bookseller. We need to, re we, we need to recognize and honor the place of the bookstore in the publishing process. And I have a real sense that this is beginning to happen. Publishers across the whole spectrum are taking a hard look at their policies and practices, wanting to bring a new rationality to the whole process. Through the good work of the ABA, booksellers are more educated than ever before and are finding ways to compete in the virtual world. And most encouraging, springing up everywhere are new bookstores, owned and operated by younger booksellers who have that passion for the word, that desire to serve as that link from writer to reader, all the while creating those places, real places, that are so necessary if we are to continue valuing and nurturing that sense of community that is so vital in the life of a culture. And my secret hope, I have this real hope, ever since I got this award, this hope developed, that 30 years from now, a once young bookseller will come before you again, thanking you for acknowledging the work he or she has been doing to keep this very, very fragile literary ecology of ours in balance. So thank you very much for this, this honor. I thank you all for, for supporting me and for supporting all that we do. Thank you.